Thank you. It is a privilege and an honor to be with you all today. I trust that you have your smiling faces on as, as I come to you through the screen. And um, I just want to say, echoing Paul, who is sufficient for these things? Would you turn with me in your Bibles to John chapter 5, John chapter 5. And as you're turning there, I would also like to pray before we begin, before we dive into God's Word. Happy Resurrection Day, saints. Let us pray. Father, I come before you to ask for for you to be glorified through our worship. Father, as we go to your word, it is our desire to see you magnified, exalted, high and lifted up. We want to see the Lord Jesus Christ and your name, Father, heralded throughout the land. And so we do pray, God, that by these mediums that you would be pleased to do just that. God, as we come before your word, we recognize the nature of it, that you have given it to us for our sanctification, for our salvation for our understanding that we might walk before you holy and blameless. So we ask God that by your spirit that you would do a work in all of us today. We pray this in the awesome, glorious name of your son that we adore. Jesus Christ. Amen. I trust you're with me in John chapter 5, and we're going to start in verse 1, and then we're going to narrow it down, and and, uh, we're going to be going into verses 19 through 29. So please uh, follow along with me if you have your Bibles ready. John chapter 5. After this, there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now there is in Jerusalem by the sheep gate a pool, in Aramaic called Bethsaida, which has five roofed colonnades. In these lay a multitude of invalids, blind, lame, and paralyzed. One man was there who had been an invalid for 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he had already been there a long time, he said to him, Do you want to be healed? The sick man answered him, Sir, I have no one to put me into the pool when the water is stirred up. And while I'm going, another steps down before me. Jesus said to him, Get up, take up your bed, and walk. And at once the man was healed, and he took up his bed and walked. Now that day was the Sabbath. So the Jews said to the man who had been healed, It is the Sabbath, and it is not lawful for you to take up your bed. But he answered them, The man who healed me, that man said to me, Take up your bed and walk. They asked him, Who is the man who said to you, Take up your bed and walk? Now the man who had been healed did not know who it was, for Jesus had withdrawn. And there was a crowd in the place. Afterward, Jesus found him in the temple and said to him, See, you are well. Sin no more, that nothing worse may happen to you. The man went away and told the Jews that it was Jesus who had healed him. And this was why the Jews were persecuting Jesus. Because he was doing these things on the Sabbath. But Jesus answered them, My father is working until now, and I am working. This is why the Jews were seeking all the more to kill him, 
because not only was he breaking the Sabbath, but he was even calling God his own father, making himself equal with God. So Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, the Son can do nothing of his own accord, but only what he sees the Father doing. For whatever the Father does, that the Son does likewise. For the Father loves the Son and shows him all that he himself is doing. And greater works than these will he show him, so that you may marvel. For as the Father raises the dead and gives them life, also the Son gives life to whom he will. The Father judges no one, but has given all judgment to the Son, that all may honor the Son just as they honor the Father. Whoever does not honor the Son does not honor honor the Father who sent him. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life. He does not come into the judgment, but is passed from death to life. Truly, truly, I say to you, an hour is coming and is now here when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear will live. For as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son also to have life in himself. And he has given him authority to execute judgment because he is the Son of Man. Do not marvel at this, For an hour is coming when all who are in the tombs will hear his voice and come out. Those who have done good to the resurrection of life and those who have done evil to the resurrection of judgment. That's the reading of God's word. So, up until verse 17, we learn that there is this invalid by the pool of Bethsaida. And he has been that way for 38 years in his life. And we we learn by the scripture here that Jesus heals this man. He not only heals him, but he tells him to pick up his bed and walk. And that very act riled up the Pharisees. We see in, in verse Um, 16 and this is why the Jews were persecuting Jesus because he was doing these things on the Sabbath the Jews had put in regulations around the Sabbath that God had never intended notice in verse 17 Jesus answered them and says my father is working until now Well, Jesus explained here that God has not created and then backed off and just let everything spin. But God in his providence has been holding everything together, sending rain, sending sunshine, making crops grow, doing all these wonderful, beautiful things. He works and therefore Jesus said, my father is working until now, and I am working. We can all just imagine the fury that these Jews had taken out on Jesus and toward Jesus in their hearts. Their judgment is that he broke the Sabbath. Well, now, if the Jews had rightly understood that Jesus had not broken the Sabbath, Maybe they would have heard what Matthew 9, 13 teaches. He says, go and learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice. For I came not to call the righteous, but sinners. Well, then they would have have clearly seen that it was a righteous act to help out a needy sinner. On the day when God's people were to gather and that their desire to persecute him was indeed sin. Blind guides they were, as Jesus rightly characterized them in Matthew fifteen fourteen for for one reference. For they neither understood the scriptures 
nor were they living them out. Here, Christ had just demonstrated his divine attributes, his mercy, his sovereignty in healing the sick. Yet the Jews only worried about themselves, how they would look, and that they could not explain the miracle, were angered and appealed only to their tradition. Instead of rightly appropriating the truth by rejoicing in God through Christ, they appealed to their own flawed orthopraxy, which was mingling God's truth with man-made regulations. What was so sad is that they put their own man-made orthopraxy above Christ and accused him, the Lord of glory, from their hearts of sin. They actually accused Jesus of sinning. And the Bible where it says in verse 18, this is why the Jews were seeking all the more to kill him, because not only was he breaking the Sabbath, but he was even calling God his own father, making himself equal to with God, to properly understand that verse of Scripture, we need to understand that Jesus was sinless. Jesus, being sinless, did not break the Sabbath. He is the Lord of the Sabbath. No, it was the Jews who accused him of sinning or breaking the Sabbath. And they were mad at him for calling his own father, or God his own father, making himself equal with God, which was absolute truth. But they did not understand the scriptures. They did not know who Jesus was. And therefore, they even sought more, all the more to kill him. They were seeking to kill the Lord of glory. Because he had broken in their minds the Sabbath and was making himself equal with God in their minds. So Jesus, in verses 19 through 29, uses this experience or this, uh, ac these accusations to give answer and to describe to us who he really is and his power his righteousness, the fact that he is our mediator. Verse 19, let's read that again. So Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, the Son can do nothing of his own accord, but only what he sees the Father doing. For whatever the Father does, that the Son does likewise. This teaches us that he was... He, he was in perfect subordination to the Father's will, and it teaches us that he was equal to the Father. The Jews looked on him as only a man in the flesh. They, they were blind guides, as Jesus said. They couldn't figure it out. They couldn't see that Jesus was the Messiah, and therefore truly God and truly man. They only saw a man. But yet, Jesus saying this is saying that he's equal with God. He, he alluded to the works of righteousness in this perfect subordination and unity in thought and essence with the Father. He would do nothing contrary to the Father's will, but only that which was in accord with the Father's will. Being one in essence with God the Father, there was perfect unity there. Healing this man was the Father's will. Healing this man brought glory to the Father. Jesus not doing anything apart from what the Father was doing. This perfect unity was also fleshed out in the next verse. For the Father, verse 20, for the Father loves the Son and shows Him all that He Himself is doing. 
and greater works than these will he show him, so that you may marvel. The love of the Father for the Son. Hebrews 1, 3, A. He, Jesus, is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. And he upholds the universe by the word of his power. And in Matthew chapter 3, verse 17, the word tells us, And behold, a voice from heaven said, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. The Father's love for his Son is unmatched. It is beautiful. This verse here ties himself as the divine Son to God the Father as being in one essence and sharing everything with him. Then that very verse alludes to the fact that greater works will be done. Greater than what? Well, greater than this healing that had just taken place. This man who is an invalid for 38 years. Now he's walking. He's well again. But remember, healings of this sort were still only temporary. For we have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And because the wages of sin is death, this man would again, or would experience death at least once. There was something that needed to be done that would be a greater work than this. Verse 21, as we go there, we're going to start seeing this. Verse 21 says, For as the Father raises the dead and gives them life, so also the Son gives life to whom He will. This verse teaches us that this greater work that Christ is talking about was a spiritual resurrection. Do you remember Ephesians chapter 2? We were dead in our sins and trespasses. A dead man can't lift himself up. But Jesus, by the Father, the will of the Father, speaks life into the dead. The gospel message speaks to people who are dead in their sins and trespasses and raises them up from the dead and gives them life. Regeneration is what is in focus here. There is no life apart from God in Christ. He is the way, the truth, and the life. 1 John 5, 2 in the ESV says, Whoever has the Son has life. Whoever does not have the Son of God does not have life. Going on to verse 22, The Father judges no one, but has given all judgment to the Son. Here we see the role of Christ being stated as judge. To be judged by Christ is an eternal judgment. To be left in their sin was to have the sentence of hell placed upon them. If Jesus kept their ears shut, this judgment was bringing glory to God, was the Father's will, and for all eternity, those who would refuse Christ, who would accuse Christ, would spend their time for eternity under the judgment of Christ. If any of the Jews at this moment had ears to hear what Christ was meaning here, then terror would have struck their hearts. Matthew 16, 27 tells us, For the Son of Man is going to come with His angels in the glory of His Father, and then He will repay each person according to what He has done. Christ, right here, had been given the judgment 
to bring on or to bring all those whom the Father had not only predestined for salvation, but to damn those who refused to worship the triune God. And when he judges, it will be to his praise and honor. The whole of creation will stand and honor Christ and his Father in the day of judgment. Verse 23 that all may honor the Son, just as they honor the Father. Whoever does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. Notice he's telling this to the Jews who were accusing him. They were not honoring him. And therefore, by not honoring him, they were not honoring the Father. And therefore, placed under the Son's judgment by the Father himself. So how the Jews were treating Jesus would end up in judgment coming on their own heads. Seeking to destroy the Son was bringing dishonor not only to the Son, but to the Father. The Father and the Son, again, being of one essence, truly God, and so to dishonor the Son was a heinous crime before a holy God. Moving on into verse 24. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life. He does not come into judgment, but has passed from death to life. Notice several times through our passage today, he says, truly, truly, I say to you, Christ is the word of God. His word holds authority over all those who hear him and all those who react by covering their ears so they won't hear him. Truly, truly, I say to you, an hour is coming and is now here, he says. Verse 25. I say to you, an hour is coming and is now here when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear will live. This complements verse 24 where it says, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life. He does not come into judgment but has passed from death to life. These are comforting words for those who have been given life from Christ and from the Father. There's a promise there. Whoever hears and believes Him who sent me has eternal life. Notice this. He does not come into judgment, but has passed from death to life. What an awesome, awesome promise. We do not come into that particular judgment. We are not any longer under the wrath of God. The wrath of God has been spent on Jesus on the cross. Those who come before Jesus and believe on his word do not come into that judgment. Notice that promise there. It's so very comforting. And now we want to dive into verses 25 through 29. And really see what's going on here. He has talked about regeneration. He has talked about judgment. And who's going who's gonna to be there? Who's not going to be there? He talks about and looks forward to the day where this judgment is coming. Look with me in verse 25 again. Truly, truly, I say to you, an hour is coming and is now here. When the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God, and those who hear will live. So he's talked twice, verse 21 and verse 24, about regeneration, this, this spiritual life, coming from death to life in the spiritual sense. And now I believe what the scriptures are telling us here is that 
not only do we receive that spiritual life, but our eye is on the fact that he is coming again and will give life. He will raise us up from the dead physically. An hour is coming and is now here. There's this, there's this tension here, the, the now, the, this has come, and the not yet, the, the focus far off. Something greater than this other miracle is going to happen. Something even greater than healing temporary. Healing temporary, but not only that, but this spiritual life then becomes reality as we are raised from the grave. There is this reiteration of the earlier verses, verses no doubt. But I believe that, that he is speaking of a both and. The bodily and the spiritual resurrection of the saints. A present reality of those who hear his voice. And a future reality of hearing his voice at the second coming and the first resurrection. The present reality of the spiritual life in Christ during the church age, and a resurrection hope in the future. And I believe he is alluding here to the second coming. He's already spoken, like I said, of, of regeneration in verses 21 and 24. But I believe there is this sense in which he's talking of the resurrection of the dead, the saints at the second coming. Now, I do, I do want to say that I, I do sympathize with the historic premillennial view. And if that comes out here, it is not to offend my brothers or sisters that may be uh, of, of an amillennial sympathy or any other of the positions. It is not that. But I trust as we go through these scriptures that regardless of where you sympathize, what, what, what way you lean toward, that this will be a blessing to you indeed. So verses 25 and 26 echo verses 21 and 22. And 25 and 26 says this, again, 25, Truly, truly, I say to you, an hour is coming and is now here, when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God, and those who hear will live. For as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son also to have life in himself. Let me just pause there for a second. He is the creator. Life comes from him. It, it begins with him. It comes out from him. And he has given him, the Father, has given him authority to execute judgment because he is the son of man. The differences we see between verses 21 and 22 from 25 and 26 is that we now see the context being judgment at the second coming of Christ. I want to turn, if you would turn with me, to Revelation chapter 20, verses 1 through 6. I'm going to read that for you. Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, holding in his hand the key to the bottomless pit and a great chain. And he seized the dragon, that ancient serpent, who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years and threw him into the pit and shut it and sealed it over him so that he might not deceive the nations any longer until the thousand years were ended. After that, he must be released for a little while. Then I saw the thrones, and seated on them were those to whom the authority to judge was committed. Also, I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for the testimony of Jesus and for the word of God, and those who had not worshipped the beast or its image and had not received its mark on their foreheads or on their hands. They came to life and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. The rest of the dead did not come to life until the thousand years were ended. This 
is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is the one who shares in the first resurrection. Over such, the second death has no power, but they will be priests of God and of Christ, and they will reign with him for a thousand years. Now, I I do take the thousand years as symbolic of a long period of time. I don't take a wooden literal interpretation of exactly a thousand years, but that being said, at the second coming of Christ, Christ raises all those believers with him. And this indeed is the first resurrection. Then a long period of time, and then the general resurrection. Verse 27. Once again. And he gives him the authority to execute judgment because he is the Son of Man. Matthew 25, 31 says, When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit on his glorious throne. And Revelation 19, 11 through 13 says, The rider on a white horse. This is what it's talking about. Then I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse. The one sitting on it is called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes are like a flame of fire, and on his head are many diadems, and he has a name written that no one knows but himself. He is clothed in a robe dipped in blood, and the name by which he is called is the Word of God. Then we dip down into verses 28 and 29. And Jesus tells them, in answer to these accusations, do not marvel at this, for an hour is coming when all who are in the tombs will hear his voice and come out. Those who have done good to the resurrection of life and those who have done evil to the resurrection of life. Of judgment. Turn back to Revelation chapter 20, and we're going to read from verses, verse 11 to the end of the chapter. It says this Then I saw a great white throne, and him who was seated on it. From his presence, earth and sky fled away, and no place was found for them. And I saw the dead great and small, standing before the throne, and books were opened. Then another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged by what was written in the books, according to what they had done. And the sea gave up the dead who were in it. Death and Hades gave up the dead who were in them, and they were judged, each one of them, according to what he had done. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. And if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. My friends, Jesus Christ has all authority over the living and over the dead. Do not marvel at this, he says to them, for an hour is coming when all who are in the tombs will hear his voice and come out. Jesus Christ, who has been resurrected from the dead, the first fruits, if you will, will, with his voice, at his command, by the Father's will, Raise every single person from the dead. That hour is coming. And those who have done good to the resurrection of life. And those who have done evil to the resurrection of judgment. Is it not so very comforting, my friends, to know that when we have received Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, that there are promises for us, that we do not come into judgment, 
but rather the love that the Father loves the Son with has been already, but not yet, placed on us. Already we've experienced the love of the Father. And once resurrected, we will experience it all the more as we, in reality, are brought before Him. But those who have done evil to the resurrection of judgment. It is Jesus Christ who has been given all authority to judge the world in righteousness. At his coming and at the general resurrection, Jesus Christ the King, he will be the one. The one who is dead but now is alive, Revelation tells us. He, the judge of all people, will be there. He will judge according to righteousness. He will judge as he sees the Father judging. There will be no escape for those who have hated Christ, who have accused Christ. He will come with his sickle and with one fell swoop will gather up all those who have railed against him. And for an eternity of eternities, they will end up under God's wrath in a place called hell. But oh, how comforting our Lord Jesus has risen from the grave. We can take great comfort and Confidence in the fact that because he has been raised from the dead, we too will be raised up to be with him. So how do we apply this scripture to ourselves? How can we bring honor to God? Well, just one thing. Jesus taught us to pray, Our Father, hallowed be thy name. Let us be prayerful that we could make our Father's name great throughout the earth. He has willed that the Son would be raised from the dead. He was in real time, in real history, publicly, He rose from the dead. And we too, the promise is there, my friends, that we too will one day be raised up with Him. Let us honor Him by praying that. Let us be about singing hymns and singing about God the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Let us be about gathering together to hear the preaching and the teaching and the sharing of Christ and Him crucified. Let us be about gathering on the Lord's Day and practicing um, that ordinance along with baptism and the Lord's Supper. And I, I, and I know we're, we're all hurting right now because we can't gather that way. But when things get back to normal, what rejoicing there'll be. What rejoicing there'll be when we each see each other's smiling faces and we, and we can again encourage one another with these exact truths that Jesus Christ has risen. He has risen indeed. Another way that you can glorify God even today is to rejoice if you have heard Jesus' word today and believe that he is Christ, the Son of the living God. For he is the giver of life. He is the judge of nations. He has the power to raise you from the dead. He, through his cross, has cleansed you from your sin. Let us glorify God and enjoy Him forever. For He is glorious. For He has risen. He is risen indeed. Would you pray with me? Father, we thank You for Your Word. We thank You that Jesus has been given the role of judge, that he is righteous, that he has been risen from the dead, that we have the promises of God 
that we will not fall under condemnation or, or be condemned at the judgment. Instead, you, Lord Jesus, were sentenced on our behalf. You took on the wrath that the Father had to give us. And instead, we received the Father's love that you deserve, that you have. You laid down your life for us. We're forever grateful. And we pray, God, that you would allow us to glorify you. Glorify the Son which glorifies you. God, we need help. We're, we're so needy, so wanting. Come, Lord Jesus. Come quickly, Lord Jesus, come.